Hi everyone, welcome to our Family Dynamics webinar. This is actually webinar number two and we're so excited to have you joining us today. Myself, Paula Quincy and Shando Turan. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I am a life and relationship coach. I am also a certified Imago Relationship Therapy Facilitator, a NLP coach and a PDA trainer and analyst, which is behavioral profiling. And I work with individuals in their personal capacity and with organizations around people and relationship dynamics and how to have healthy relationships. Shanda, over to you. I have a practice in Santon. Um, it's booming. I'm busy. And yeah, Paula sends me a lot of clients and I send Paula a lot of clients. And, 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 and we hold webinars and seminars together. We do. Um, among, yeah. And we've run together and we've r done races together. We've done a whole lot together. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> So, Shando, we, in our last webinar, um, we spoke quite a bit around um, relationships in general, marriages, what your rights are according to the law, um, divorce, custody, we touched on that a bit, and quite a few questions came out of that session, um, which is why we're having webinar number two and following up on some of those questions that we were asked. And one of the, the first sort of questions that came out in the last session um, is, is there such a thing as a common law husband and wife? Okay, Paula, the straight answer is no. Um, in some countries, uh, they recognize cohabitation as a legal form, especially if there's been children involved um, and you have joint property together. But um, in our country, if you want the benefits of marriage, as in reciprocal maintenance um, or parties being responsible for each other, you actually have to get married. However, it's not as dire as it seems. And people who choose to be in long-term monogamous relationships, and it doesn't even have to be monogamous, but people who show each other long-term commitment can draw up cohabitation agreements, which can deal with the assets. It's almost, you know, if you're, if you're one day your marriage, let's call it a marriage, one day your marriage will end, it will end by death or by divorce. But there will come a day when it'll be over. It's by death, you need a will. If it's by divorce, you need an antinatural contract. But if you're in a committed cohabitation relationship, you can draw up what is called a life partnership agreement, which is very similar to an antinatural contract, which will say, okay, we've got a joint property. Um, if we do then split up one day, the party who retains property will buy out the other party at market related value, or if we can't decide, then it will get sold in open market value and the profit if any will get split and so and so and so and so and so. And um, you can have an agreement and it can be, uh, that agreement is enforceable in court as a, as a contract, as a civil contract. Also, whether you are married or not, if you have children together, the Maintenance Act is applicable. Both parents must maintain the children. So, you know, you have to put a roof over their head, clothes on their back, food on their plate, and pay for their education and, 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 and medical. So, so those are the, those are the, um, um, so children. <laughs> somebody else, I can hear somebody else in the background as well. Um, yeah, so, so the, the, the children still need to get maintained. The Maintenance Act still applies. The Children's Act still applies. So even though you don't have a reciprocal duty of support, you still, um, 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 you, you, your children and, and, and maintenance and medical for the children are still, are still taken care of. That is not affected by the fact whether you're married or not. Yeah, and um, I just know from, from my own um, situation in terms of being in a, I guess what you would call a cohabitating relationship for the last seven years, um, you know, even though we don't have that, that piece of paper, so to speak, that marriage license, um, we consider ourselves married in all forms. You know, we own property together, we uh, share expenses and costs and those kind of things and, and how we contribute to stuff. So. I think also part of it, and that's part of what I deal with with a lot of the couples that come to me, is the mindset around, um, you know, does it make a difference if you are married or not and you have that piece of paper? Um, and, and I was doing an interview the other day for one of the radio stations and we were talking about this topic and it's, it's around, for me personally, you know, marriage is a, is a personal experience, it's a personal choice and people do it for all sorts of reasons. 
Um, people do it because they want to do it in terms of uh, faith or religion or, or, you know, in the eye of God or, or whatever it is that, that is important to them and personal to them. Um, other people do it for because, because of cultural, traditional reasons, whatever it might be. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, a ring doesn't make you any more or any less committed to a person or a partner or your marriage or your relationship. You show it every day in your thoughts and your actions and your behavior in terms of how you're showing up, how you're contributing to your relationship on all levels. I'm not just talking financial here because people often assume contribution is just financial, but there's more than that. And then, um, you know, how you treat each other when you're with each other, but also how you treat each other when you're not with each other. You know, how you speak about each other to other people and about your relationship to other people. You know, your actions and your thoughts and your behavior show how committed you are to each other in your relationship and your level of um, the health and the quality of your relationship. If I pull, if I can just cut in there, and, and, and this is something actually I've been meaning to ask you, um, and I actually can't believe I haven't asked you this before. Should you wear, let's say you are married, should you wear, are you of the opinion that you should wear a wedding ring? I am of the opinion that you should. I think if you're going to yeah, take that you're going to act like you're married, you should actually yeah, you know, again, it is, um, it's a personal choice, um, you know, in terms of whether you want to, to wear that wedding ring or not. Um, some people believe that um, if you're not wearing your wedding ring, you've got something to, to hide. Um, other people believe that, um, you know, yes, you should, because it shows the rest of the world that you're taken and that you belong to someone. But again, wearing a wedding ring doesn't mean that you're not going to go and cheat on your partner or that you're not going to go and have an affair or that you're not going to go and get divorced. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's again, for me, it's that mindset that if I am married or if I'm committed, I know what those boundaries and what that barrier is. And if I'm choosing to cross it, that tells me something about myself, but also the health and the quality of my relationship. And, and so again, for me, it's a personal choice in terms of whether you want to wear a wedding ring or not. I've had couples that have come to see me where it has been an issue. And for example, the man, because he's in a job where it requires quite a lot of manual labor or physical labor, you know, he's using his hands and stuff, that in some cases it can be a real safety hazard. So, so for those reasons, doesn't wear a wedding ring. Um, and for other reasons, um, you know, just the, the type of, you know, some people have been um, allergic to gold for example, and they come out in very sort of big rashes or, or um, welts um, from wearing uh, metals like gold and stuff. So, yeah, you know, again, for me, it's a personal choice whether you should or shouldn't, but if you choose not to, um, understand the reasons why you're not doing it and make sure that both partners are comfortable with it and, 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 and trust and respect each other's um, choices or decisions or find a middle ground. Yeah, I think for me, it's just the first line of defense. You know, it's uh, the world's a very, very different place out there. When, when, when my grandfather got married, I think his choices in women were limited to six, of which three were his cousins. You know, it's, and now I can, I can sit basically while I'm in, at the home with my partner and have indecent or improper relationships with a number of people. Um, just via the internet. Um, it really has changed that space. So I think as many defenses as you can put up against the, the, the attack on your institution and on the, on the sacredness of your marriage, it would be a good thing. And like you said, I had a conversation with my daughter this morning and I said to her, listen, um, if you want to give yourself some advice in your relationship, because she's in a long-term committed relationship as well. And if your boyfriend has to travel and go away and business and stuff like that, just say to him the following, and, and the same applies to you. You must behave at all times as if you're with him. You mustn't exactly. behave differently when you're there and when you're not there. And she said one of the things that she really enjoys about him is the fact that um, whether he's with his friends and she's there, or whether he's not with his friends and they're alone, he treats her the same way. He shows affection. He doesn't try and act all cool and everything. And I think that's, that sort of ties in with what you're saying. It's how you yeah. behave and what you yeah. put out there. Yeah, Apollo, exactly. this is... This is the old, the old chestnut that we always come back to and we're never going to avoid this. And this is when people come and see me and I send them to you. Can you rebuild trust again once it's gone? And let me come in first there. You know, people focus a lot on trust and the breach of trust. I think trust gets in a relationship, even the relationship that functions, trust gets breached every now and then. 
Uh, you don't have to lie, but you can be economical with the truth. And as I said to you before, people are really dishonest with each other about money. You know, shoes were always on sale. The golf kit was always on sale when it wasn't. I even have people buying stuff and hiding it um, because they feel guilty about it. It's a lot of guilt and shame associated with finances. And, and, and trust gets broken and a lot of times by the stuff you don't say to people. And as I said to you before, people always say, oh, trust is the tree out of which everything grows. I disagree. I think respect is a tree out of which everything grows. And once you lose your respect for a person, if they continuously come home drunk on a two, two o'clock on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a Tuesday afternoon, um, I mean, they're not worthy of respect and you're not going to respect them. And then, you know, for me in a relationship, love comes and goes. Um, it does. But, and, and trust to an extent sometimes comes and goes as well. But if you lose your respect for that person, then I think it's, it's, it's best just to pack it in because then nothing comes back. So, but coming back to the old chestnuts, Trust has been broken. And let's talk about third-party involvement. That's generally, well, let's not even say active third-party involvement as in an intimate affair. Let's say you find your partner flirting on the internet with somebody. You can see where this is going to go. And it's a work colleague, somebody who they saw in whose company they're still going to be. Can it be rebuilt? Trust can be rebuilt um, if both partners are willing to do the work. And I've had couples that have come to me with situations like this. And I've had some where it just, it just was too hard and they just couldn't do the work. They couldn't find a way around forgiveness. And I'll touch on that just now. And eventually they ended up parting ways. And I've had other couples that have really dug in deep and done the work. And it's actually changed their relationship 360. It's shifted their relationship to a stronger place than before because they were both prepared to look within. How did I contribute to us getting into this situation? And how can I contribute to getting us out of this situation? And they really did the hard yards. Um, trust, yes, we, we trust on so many different levels when it comes to our partners or people in general, but especially our partners. We trust on an emotional level. We trust on a, on a physical, intimate, sexual level. We trust when it comes to, to our money. We trust when it comes to our lives. We trust when it comes to our children and being the mother or father of our kids. There's so many levels that we trust on. Um, but yes, respect definitely. When respect goes out the window, there, there's, sure, it's, it's very hard to come back from that. I've worked with couples, particularly where there's been some sort of infidelity or, or trust that's been broken, let's say, for example, gambling, um, things like that. Then, yes, uh, forgiveness. First of all, I work with a couple on understanding what does forgiveness mean in your world because we associate different meanings with different words. So forgiveness in my world could be something very different in your world. And we need to get that clear first. What does it mean before we can work through it? And, and forgiveness, often people associate forgiveness with uh, I'm condoning what you did. I'm saying that it's okay because I'm accepting it. And that's so not true. Forgiveness is around, yes, understanding and accepting that this happened. We can't go back, we can't fix it, we can't change it. So accept that it has happened. Then it's accept my feelings and my emotions. I'm feeling angry, I'm feeling upset, I'm feeling hurt, I'm feeling pissed off, I'm feeling all of these things, which you're entitled to do. You're entitled to feel your feelings and your emotions because they are real to you, it's your reality. Then how do you work through that? And this is what, you know, it's what do I need from you as my partner to, to be able to get closure and move forward not stay stuck in the past and closure can consist of all things it can be well i've got unanswered questions and i need to i need the answers to be able to get the closure to move on or i may need an apology um, and and a sincere apology not just you know i'm sorry but one that's really heartfelt one that really shows genuine remorse and and and, and genuine sincerity and then what are the boundaries or the barriers that we're going to put down that we will ensure that this doesn't happen again and that we move forward together. We, we, we give each other the reassurance that we need that that is not going to happen again. And this is where communication comes in in terms of honesty and transparency and openness and rebuilding the trust. And research shows that can it, it can take up to two years to rebuild trust in a relationship. Well, that's a long time, eh? That's that's hard. Yeah. Um, yeah, and just uh, just yeah, it's 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 it's. I deal with people that have been in those situations and that have tried, and then a lot of times, 
people spend a lot of time at work. So a lot of time, the person can't afford to give up their job and the infidelity was with a work colleague. And that is just unacceptable for the other party that that person every day will still be in contact with that person. Um, and that, uh, that, that generally is a ton of bricks that uh, breaks the camel's back. Um, you know, another thing I think that also, and I think you and I have talked about this before, is the, the, the big thing about gender that's being made about gender-based violence at the moment. And uh, as I said to you before, a good divorce lawyer, if there hasn't been violence and there hasn't been addiction, and generally the two go together, then a good divorce lawyer will always try and talk you out of divorce. As a matter of fact, I've just sent somebody to you this week where I'm trying to talk them out of divorce. I don't think there's been an irretrievable breakdown of their relationship. But a lot of hype is being made about gender-based violence at the moment. And the Domestic Violence Act is a, it's a very poorly drafted piece of legislation and it's generally quite badly implemented. And if you have a verbal argument with somebody, depending on which magistrate or judge you're in front of, that could generally be an act of domestic violence. So acts of domestic violence get committed in relationships that actually work almost on a weekly basis. I mean, calling somebody a name or telling them to, you know, what off, um, it, it, it could be seen as an act of domestic violence. Um, um, so the, the Domestic Violence Act is a, is, a, is a very, and it gets used a lot in divorces by people trying to position themselves so that they can get a better financial settlement. And, and, and it's, it's um, quite sad. And it also gets used to bar, especially husbands from seeing their children, um, that um, you know, they, are, they were very upset because they caught their partner cheating on them there was an argy bargy, but um, yeah, yeah, it's wrong. But obviously, emotions were high. But this person has never been a danger to their children. That's never been alleged. And now suddenly, they can't see their children unless it's supervised. And that's really, really terrible. And might I just come in on on, on gender-based violence? A lot, a lot of gender-based violence is is female on male. Yet the people, the men, are too ashamed to address that in court. It gets swept under the table. Let's not mention it. And there's sort of an almost a, a knowing out there that the the woman can come after the, the, the man with a tire iron, but if he pushes her in defense of himself, he's going to be the one that's going to end up being arrested. That's just that institutional memory of, of the role of men and the role of women. And it's actually quite tragic. And I can say I have a lot of files on my desk where really quite heinous and repeated violence has been committed against men but there's too much shame attached for them to actually do something about it. So yeah, there's gender-based violence. Yes, it's wrong, but I can say the, it's not as patriarchal and one-sided as the media will make you believe. It's actually quite common and it's both ways. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that 100%. And, and as you know, I've been running both a men's and a women's program for the last six years um, around personal growth and development. And this is often a topic that comes up in both groups. And um, yeah, so first of all, the society and, and the labels and the stigma attached to gender-based violence. And, and I'm not only talking about male and female, I'm also talking about the LGBTQI spectrum as well, because that also um, plays a big role with some of the couples that I work with. Um, in that any form of violence, physical, mental, emotional, sexual, financial, is, 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 is unacceptable. I don't care who you are, it, it's just unacceptable. Um, and yes, it happens across all those spectrums. And I think we need to start removing the stigmas, the shame, the embarrassment, the, the hush, hush, don't say anything. We, do, we need to make it okay for victims across all spectrums to speak out and to be respected and, and um, believed. Because so often they are not believed or it's downplayed. Um, or that it was, oh, it was your own fault, or, oh, no, it was this, or it was that. Or, there's so many ways of justifying it. And, and I'm, I'm talking across all spectrums here. But it does happen, as we both know, because we both deal with it in so many different ways. And I think the, the most important thing is, yeah, so for, let's talk from a legal perspective, irrespective of who you are. If you are a victim of gender-based violence, what are your legal rights? Well, firstly, depending on the severity, you can go lay a criminal charge of assault or if the person used an object, which is quite often the case, whether it be an iron or a cup, a metal cup, like the one I've just got in my hands, then it's assault GBH, assault uh, with the intent to do grievous bodily harm, which is quite a serious charge. So you can go and lay criminal charges, but quite often than not, people do not want to see um, the other party, especially if there's children involved. They don't want the children 
to see the other party being carted away in the back of a police van. Um, I tell them that um, at least go to the police station and do an OB entry, an occurrence book entry, to say that you were there, this has happened, that the people will treat you more seriously. But unfortunately, the police don't show up for murder. So generally, they're not really going to just come to your house if you say that the person has been beating you up until you've actually been for a medical examination and do, done a form, which they call the J88. If you go to the police station with a J88 where you've been examined by a doctor or a district surgeon, that's a different story. Then they sort of, then they're going to take action. But if you want the person to stop and you want to try and save the relationship, there's a domestic violence act in which you apply for an interim order. And there's various acts of domestic violence ranging from what you and I understand as violence, one person taking on the other person physically, but there's verbal abuse, psychological abuse, there's also economic abuse. And, and the courts don't generally grant it, um, which is a great point of frustration for me. They're saying, well, if you want maintenance, go to the maintenance court. But there's something I would like to act to add to the Domestic Violence Act to level the playing field because it really gets used against men very, very badly. And I would like to add parental alienation as an act of domestic violence, yeah. as an act of abuse towards children, where the, the children have a good relationship with a parent, usually the father. There's a breakup and then suddenly a week later the children are afraid to go to the father, are afraid to be with him and somehow believe that he is a danger to them. Um, and because of what the other part, what usually the mother and, and uh, uh, look, not that fathers don't commit domestic violence, but it's generally the custodial parent who does it against the custodial parent. I've had heinous acts of domestic violence committed by fathers as well, but generally they're not the custodial parent. But it's where the children don't want to leave the home of the custodial parent and they're somehow afraid to go to the non-custodial parent. Where a week ago, they loved the person, they couldn't wait to be with him. But then somehow they are made to believe that one, that person doesn't love you. Two, they're a danger to you. The custodial parent is the only person that really loves them. And that um, if you have a good relationship with them, it will negatively affect your relationship with the custodial parent. That's sort of this, uh, and it's, 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 it's terrible, the effect it has on, on, on children. It really confuses them. And it's like a dog that gets kicked by both, but has two owners and gets kicked by both. Even though the one owner is not doing the kicking, the dog then is left with no one. Because um, eventually the children do turn against the person who's doing the alienation and then they truly have no one. And there is a range of sexual predators who lie and wait for those children um, who know the signs. And what you're doing to your child, rather give them cigarettes. It'll be less harmful to them. And, and that's, that's a big fight that I have, parental alienation. There are some countries where parental alienation, and now I know I'm going a bit off topic here and this wasn't part of it, but it's something I'm so passionate about. There are some countries like Mexico and in South America where Lieutenant Dave is right now, um, where, where parental alienation is a criminal offense because it's seen as child abuse because you are abusing that child. Um, and I'm hoping one day that we could have parental alienation as an act of domestic violence, where if the one parent is committing act of domestic violence, putting fear in the, in, in, in the child for that parent, or when it's that parent's child turn to see the child, then suddenly the child has a play date or is, has a sports event exactly planned there, or suddenly is signed up for a hockey thing when the child doesn't even want to play hockey, but it's exactly in the time when they're supposed to see the other parent that that be seen as, a, as, a, um, as an act of domestic violence. So that's yes. something I'm actually quite actively working with. And I, I see obviously the other side of it where I, I get to the, whether it's the individual, so the post-divorce trying to pick up the pieces and, and, and move on and start over again, or someone that's in an, an abusive relationship. And that the emotional, the mental and emotional impact that it has on the individual as well as the children. And, and just, you know, the first seven years of a child's life is the most crucial because that is where our emotional foundation is formed. And thereafter, those messages and that conditioning is reinforced time and time again. And, and that kind of shapes our perspective of what love and relationships should look like or what it looks like to us based on our conditioning. And we invariably, you know, carry that with us into our adult relationships. Um, and, and that's also where... Um, how I'm showing up in my relationship and how I'm co-creating can lead to problems and issues in relationships, which is past hurts and traumas, childhood baggage, childhood trauma. Um, and it plays out in the relationship because we are unable to have or create healthy attachment when it comes to, to relationships. So it, it has a huge impact. It just poisons everything. Yeah. 
I just and, want to put a pause for one moment and just see if any of our, our people listening in, if they have any questions they want to ask on what we've been chatting about um, up until now. If you do have a question, please unmute yourself and ask us or, or pop it in the chat box. Ask us your question in the chat box and we'll answer it for you. Any questions from anybody? Yes. Anybody from my side, don't you dare ask a question. Type it. <laughs> maybe, they, maybe they're still shy for now. <laughs> okay, no, fantastic. Keep it that way. Um, <laughs> Paul, another thing I wanted to ask you about, and I've, I've seen this more and more, um, and uh, it's, it's kind of a funny occurrence. A lot of, there's a lot of Hindu Christian marriages um, where it wasn't a problem at the time when they got married, but then at the time of the divorce, it becomes a big problem, especially what should the children be brought up in so i don't know if that qualifies on the culture um does that yeah if i can ask a broad question in that sense does culture play a role it must to some extent and how do you sort of marry the two yeah and yeah. who decides what religion you are and what religion the children get brought up in this is, this is a big thing that often comes up um with couples that i work with um from from different cultures or even interracial interracial couples um culture can cause lots of issues because um the example a couple that i was working with he was from a very uh, traditional family traditional background and um, whereas she and her family were more i don't want to use the word westernized but more open-minded let's put it like that and and he was insisting and so was his family his family was applying a lot of pressure to have their son circumcised the traditional way and go through the whole initiation um, process. And she was so not wanting to, for this to happen and, and also her family as well. So the families were getting involved and it was causing a lot of issues in their, in their marriage. And, and so, yeah, just like, so from a workplace perspective, just like leaders create the culture in the workplace and that corporate culture and environment, it's the same in the home. The parents create the culture or the vibe or the environment for children and everyone else to grow up and thrive in. And this is often where couples don't do the work. They don't sit down because when we're in that honeymoon romantic phase, we don't think it's going to be big issues because we love each other, right? And we're going to live happily ever after until we start getting into those situations where either we've started having children or there's expectations around, um, well, we celebrate Christmas this way. No, but we do it this way. And then it's like, well, who, whose parents or whose family are we going to go to? How are we going to do it? Um, and so this is really where couples need to sit down and talk about these things in terms of, well, these are my beliefs or my faiths or my religion. This is what is important for me. And I would like to retain this in, in our relationship and from both sides. So you both understand what's important. And if you don't, believe in the same things how can you create a space where you can still respect that that's that person's space and faith and allow them to practice that but it doesn't come in between your relationship and become an issue um, so how do you respect each other's beliefs and faiths how do you find a middle ground and how do you how do you support each other in in moments or, or, or things that are important to either one of you so let's say, for example, Shanda, you have to, let's say you're Jewish and I'm Christian and the Jewish celebrate Christmas this way and I'm Christian and we celebrate, um, you know, Christmas Day and Christmas lunch is a big thing. Well, how do we do that? So it's around, well, because I love and care about you and we're in a relationship, I'm coming to support you at your family's event in the way that you celebrate because it's important to you and I respect and love and care about you and vice versa knowing what's important to me, how are you going to be there and support me? Because as a relationship, as a couple, you are a team and it's about supporting each other. Uh, Paula, I see there's a question in the um, box and Infonisa, thanks for that comment. I, I really do appreciate it, Paula and I. I see there's a question from Melanie. Um, can you sort of, Paula, can you take that first and then I'll deal with the legalities? Sure. So, Melanie, are bad, are bad moods of a spouse which makes family relationships difficult? and can it cause a significant amount of anxiety, emotional stress, or seen as abuse? Absolutely. 
the, the way we show up in our relationships can can definitely impact because first of all we are energy beings we are emotional beings we are feeling beings so if I'm constantly showing up in my relationship in a bad mood, I'm without a doubt going to impact my relational space, the space between me and my partner. And it is going to cause um, anxiety and stress potentially because I'm going to, if I'm on the receiving end, I'm maybe asking, what have I done wrong? Is it me? Is it something I've done? Is it something I've said? So that whole walking on eggshells, all of that can start coming out to play. And it could be something related to the relationship. So we sweep it under the carpet and we don't deal with it. We avoid it. Or it could be something completely outside of our relationship. And this is where communication is key in being able to create a space where my partner can, can open up and share and tell me what's going on. Because if I don't know what's going on, I don't know how to be there for you. I don't know how to support you through it. I don't know how to help you. Yeah, if I can just come in, Melanie, on the legalities of it. A bad mood is not a an act of domestic violence. However, the effects of a bad mood, if it leads to emotional badgering, an argument, a verbal argument, a physical argument, if it spills over, that certainly is a form of abuse. Uh, unfortunately, we live such stressed lives at the moment. Um, I don't know who doesn't have bad moods every now and then. I think the trick is not to take it out on your partner. And you know, people expect us to sort of, you're at work, you're super stressed, you're having a bad day, and then suddenly you must go home and you must be in a good mood. You know, um, people expect us, I always refer to the Star Trek movies, people expect us to be like Vulcans, like Mr. Spock. We are thinking beings that feel once in a while. The truth is actually true. Uh, the opposite is actually true. We're like Captain Kirk. We are feeding beings that think once in a while. And um, to suddenly have, you know, have a little zapper that you can stun your emotions away and now suddenly a bad day suddenly becomes a good day because you're walking through the front door. You know, I wouldn't have a job if, if, if that was how life works. Life doesn't work that way. So as far as is, is a bad mood, uh, uh, active domestic violence, no. However, the, the effects of a bad mood over time can most certainly be uh, some form of abuse or domestic violence. But let me just come out and say that all people have bad moods. Uh, bad moods isn't something that is just the domain of your partner. Trust me, no matter how good you think you are, you also have bad moods and off days. It's the human condition. Yeah. And I think that's where um, we talk about, um, you know, how, what does a healthy relationship look like? You know, with the people associate or assume that a healthy relationship is what we read in the fairy tale books growing up, where the prince and the princess, you know, he's going to sweep her off her feet and they're going to live happily ever after. And that's unrealistic because we have ups and downs, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's in our relationships, whether it's that, that's life, we have ups and downs and it's dealing with those ups and downs and it's the same when it comes to our relationship. It's learning to deal with ups and downs and learning to resolve conflict and understanding that there is no such thing as the perfect person or the perfect relationship, but how perfect can we be for each other that we bring the best out of each other, we lift each other up instead of being destructive where we destroy each other. I see there's a question for, for from Vian over there and uh, Hi, Vian. I see. Can you explain the process? After divorce, one parent loses his residency in the country and needs to return the country of birth. Um, Vian, that's a, actually a very sticky situation and actually quite tragic. Um, I've, I've had a number of situations like that or where somebody leaves the country because they've got to go and renew their visa. And quite often it's the mother. Let's say the mother is from Zimbabwe, the father is South African. And I ha I've had this a lot with the Zimbabwe South Africa issue. I've also had this with, uh, I've currently got a client that's in the United Arab Emirates that his wife, uh, um, they're going through a divorce. Um, he went back to the UAE, had to go back there for business. While he was in the UAE, his wife laid criminal charges against him, unbeknownst to him, and he missed the court date, so a warrant of arrest was issued for him. Now, he can't come back into the country, because as soon as he comes back into the country, he's going to get arrested at the airport. What they do is they put out a warning, if there's a warrant of arrest out for you based on your ID or your passport number, as soon as that passport number gets triggered at the airport, guess what? Red lights go off and they put you in chains. So it's a very difficult situation. So losing your res residency, I'd say, the people don't generally lose their residency is they go to their country and then they can't get a visa to come back. That's generally the, 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 the issue that I deal with all the time. And it's tricky. Then it falls into the area of immigration law. 
How do you get back? How do you acquire a visa to come back into the country? The fact that you are a committed parent who have been involved in your children's lives and you have a life here and you have children who it would be in their best interest to see their father or their mother certainly plays a big role. I've done urgent applications in that regard to allow the person to come in on an interim basis while Home Affairs finalizes the issue. Unfortunately, if there's a warrant of arrest out for you, like my one client who's sitting in Bahrain at the moment, it's difficult. You have to go then go deal with a warrant of arrest. Uh, the prosecutors are very harsh. They don't care. Um, for them, it's just, you know, it's, it'll be an easy warrant, an easy case, an easy arrest because the person isn't there to defend themselves. Um, and that's just another, it's a stat form that they fill in. They've gotten another conviction. So that's what it's about for them, unfortunately, and the children are suffering. But you just have to sort of look at the big picture, see which laws are being transgressed. Usually it's an immigration matter. And then brief an immigration attorney on how to deal with the matter. Generally, people don't lose, don't lose their residency just willy-nilly it's got to do generally with a permit that's expired the person's overstayed their welcome and now they want to go back i've generally found that if there is residency issues i'll advise the person not to leave the country let's rather go with an immigration lawyer to 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 home affairs and see how we can deal with the situation without the person having to leave and put the whole thing that this is their address this is their tax number this is the following and deal with it that way that the person generally doesn't have to leave they can go to their country's embassy in the country if there is one and deal with it there so yeah beyond that 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 would be a good question it's a it's, it's a difficult process it's sticky and it differs from country to country and once the person is out it's very hard to come back so I try to have the person not leave. Please, the questions are great. If you have any others, please um, do pop them in the chat box or just um, raise your hand and mute yourself and ask us. We'll be happy to answer. I see, um, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing the name right, Mufuniso has said Mufuniso, yeah. He's just listening, um, listening to the great topics or points and wish that this would be made public because there needs to be a greater shared understanding. So happy to say that we are recording the session and we will be sending out the link to the recording and you're welcome to share it with others and it will also be available um, on my YouTube channel. So um, we'll send that link out to everybody that attended today um, because um, we have your email addresses. Um, so thanks for that. Yeah, thanks, Vanessa. Um, and also, um, um, if I can just uh, jump in on uh, uh, another question I wanted to ask you, Paula, and this is also a little chestnut that comes up every time and you already know what I feel about that is, should couples go for counseling whether they're thinking of divorce or not? And my short answer is, I think all couples should once in a while attend marriage counseling just to get the spoken and unspoken rules of the relationship out in the open again and just touch base on that. It's almost like, should you go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist only when you're in trouble? No, I think you should go there when you're healthy, just to sort of maintain. So I think counseling is always a good thing. Um, um, and I, I think it helps. It, 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 it shows you the red flags that are in your relationship that you possibly weren't even aware of, and you can deal with them before they become serious issues. So Paula, should couples go for counseling, whether they're getting divorced or not? Uh, absolutely. I mean, you and I, we both agree on this. Generally what happens is couples will go for premarital counseling because it's almost a condition of getting married. The priest or the minister or whoever that they are dealing with. Um, would, would recommend that they have to go for a minimum of six sessions or whatever the program is that they're running before they get married to make sure that they're making the right decision. Now, a lot of us, when we think about marriage, we are actually in the back of our minds thinking about our wedding day. We don't think further than that in terms of long term and what does it take to and sustain a relationship for, for the happily ever after. And I like to use the, the car analogy. So every year we take in our car for an annual service to make sure that the engine's okay, the brakes are working, the this, the that, the whatever. Because as we drive our cars, there's obviously wear and tear and depreciation, all those kind of things. Well, it's actually no different to our relationships. As we become more and more settled in our relationship and more comfortable in our relationship, we become more complacent. And we stop making the efforts that we used to make when we were in the honeymoon romantic phase. And or as we grow and evolve as individuals from a career point of view, from an experience point of view, from an age point of view, um, our relationship changes and evolves. And what generally tends to happen is a lot of couples end up growing apart instead of growing together. 
And this is where marriage counseling or therapy or coaching, or whatever it is that you want to call it or whoever you want to go and see can actually be a benefit because it's, it's like taking your relationship in for an annual maintenance check, helping you learn skills to keep you on track and to keep your relationship healthy instead of what most couples do is they leave it until it's too late and that's when they want to try and put a band-aid over it and they want to come in for a quick fix but they're not prepared to do the work and invariably they don't really last. Okay, Paula, I see there's just another question from Tukilo there as well. He said, just to add to Vian's question, on the other side of the coin, if not losing your residency, but rather choosing to go back to some different country, especially your parents' home country, will the decision negatively impact the co-parenting arrangement should you go through divorce? Well, I'd say absolutely. Firstly, divorce negatively impacts co-parenting parenting relationships. Um, everything gets turned up on its head. Uh, children sometimes become a contestation, like a prize to be won. Um, you know, the one parent wants to use the legal system to punish the other parent, and it's actually quite tragic. Um, and, the, and, and, you know, the old saying, when the elephants do battle, it's the grass that gets trampled. So divorce on its own is a challenge to co-parenting. You're getting divorced because you couldn't get along, and now suddenly you have to cooperate better than you were cooperating before for the benefit of your children. Um, and you have to do that while they're extremely angry and hurt and resentful towards each other. That's difficult. That's a tall ask. And it doesn't, it doesn't, that's why you need a document called a parenting plan, which sort of takes the, doesn't matter how I feel about you, we both still have a right to play a role in our children's lives. That's called a parenting plan. It gets made in order of court. It takes that, the fact that I want to spit on your grave, it takes that away and says that you still have an important part to play in your children's lives. And so do I, irrespective of the fact that I am actually quite angry at you. Um, but when you move into another country, move into another country, let's say the rights of a normal divorce parent, and I'm saying every situation is different, but there is sort of a baseline. It's every alternate weekend, and in the non-alternate week, it's sort of uh, a night out or a sleepover on a Wednesday or a Thursday. Now, if you live in another country, it's going to be quite difficult for for you to stick to that. So then the other thing is, okay, so when are you gonna see the children? Well, you're probably gonna see the children more liberally over the, their school holidays, their long school holidays. Now, the other question is again, will the other party allow the children to go to you in the foreign country? What if you, and this is a very real issue, what if you decide, that, no, I'm not sending them back? Now, with a lot of countries out there, there's a reciprocal enforcement uh, uh, agreement where you can do an application that's called the Hague Convention. Um, but a lot of countries, your Arab Emirates countries, your UAE countries, there's no such agreement. So if the person then moves there with the children and decides that, oh, but listen, honey, you're not seeing them anymore, or I'm moving to another address and doesn't tell you where it is, it's really, 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 really difficult. Uh, and I'm dealing with two of those matters right now concerning UAE countries, not, not the other matter I was discussing previously where the mother had moved to Dubai or wherever with the children, promised liberal, liberal access to the father. And when it was time for the access, she just said, no, cut off all contact and move to another address. And that's it. He's basically lost his children. And unless we, and we all have briefed a private investigator to go there and try and find them, but it's difficult. Now, once we find them, what do we do? Because our judgments are not enforceable over there. It's a... Uh, it's difficult. It's, it's, it's not for the faint hearted. And I think the real issue is there is, yes, you can still draw up a parenting plan, which allows for liberal visitation for the children to come and visit you, but it will require a degree of trust on the, the other party because what often happens, and just by the way, my son is just opening up the door. Honey, I'm on a webinar. Close the door, please. Thank you. Um, my lovely son, Justin, whom I specifically forbade to come here, which is here right now. Anyway, there he goes. He'll be back just now. And the, the God bless him from a distance. And, but the bottom line is the, the, the degree of trust involved. And generally what is put in a parenting plan like that is the other parent lets the children go. But there's got to be return plane tickets. And there's got to be um, an enforcement mechanism. You've got to know where they're going to be at sort of what address. Not a day-to-day -day schedule, but if there's a problem, if there's an issue, I will be here at my mom's place. I will be here at my place. Here's the name of my work colleagues, my employment, and I will bring the children back. Um, and there's that undertaking, but that's about as hard as you can put it. Um, and there are issues. There are real, real issues with that because, you know, a lot of times when a relationship breaks up, there's a lack of trust. And now suddenly you, that person has to trust you. You have to trust that person. When you send the kids to Australia, Zimbabwe or England, that that other person is going to put them back on a plane. And quite often they don't.
So it's, there, there's real issues there. You can limit some of the damage with a parenting plan that states what to do and what will happen, but to an extent, you can never fully cover all the contingencies and it's, it's a really, really difficult issue. I see you've got another one um, from Shantae. Just a quick question. Do children have a say in the drafting of a parenting plan, obviously taking into account their age, and will they be given any weight to their choices? Section 10 of the Children's Act is, is written very loosely, but it says based on a child's age, stage of development and maturity. So age is a pretty set term, but stage of development and maturity are very nebulous terms. Um, but basically what it comes down to, the older the child is, the more say the child will have. Um, so children have stages of development. You have the, the zero to three phase, which is infant. Then you have the three to six phase, which is sort of toddler, young child. Then you sort of have the six phase when the child sort of starts formal schooling, six to sort of uh, 10, 11, which is preteen. Um, and then teenager from sort of 11, 12 onwards. And basically the teenager, if the teenager says, I want to go live with the other parent, um, you, you can't just say it under the carpet or rub it under the carpet. Oh, you're being foolish, you're being stupid. And, and the child is going to say that at some stage. We are mammals and mammals rebel against central authority. Whether you're a seal or a penguin or a lion, at some stage you, you want to be the big dog and you challenge the alpha male and, and or female and you get kicked out. So that generally happens and the child will at some stage want to go live with the other parent. And um, the yardstick still is not what the child wants, but what is in the best interest of the child. So the child certainly has to be listened to, but if the other parent stays in a really crappy neighborhood and they have a drinking problem um, and their bills are unpaid, um, you know, you'd be, as the other parent would be saying, yeah, you know what, I hear what you're saying, but it's not going to happen. And, you know, you are welcome, the other parent is welcome to, to bring the matter to court and say, oh, my child wants to come live with me. But the yardstick is not what the child wants. It's what is in the child's best interest. But the older the child is, the more weight the voice will carry of the child. Quite often the child wants to go live with the other parent as an act of rebellion. Or maybe they genuinely do want to spend time with the other parent. Generally, I've seen when, when boys hit about 10 or 11, they instinctively want to be with a man. They, they want to learn what it means to be a man and not that they love their mother any less, but there comes a stage when, when um, they want to do ma man things and boy things. And not that their mom can't do them with them, but they want their dad. Um, and I, I've seen this a lot. And um, yeah, so the older the child is, the more their voice has weight. But the yardstick is the child's best interest. You know, a lot of times when the child wants to go live with the other parent, it's because there's Xbox and the second cell phone. That's not the child's best interest. Also, I think important to note is that um, the children have different relationships with the parent and the, each parent plays a different role in the child's development. And in order to have a balanced um, perspective and learn how to have healthy relationships with males and females. Um, it's important for children to spend time equally with both parents um, to because it's important to part of their development as part of their development and their functioning on, a, on an emotional level um, as well as obviously building that relationship with each parent. Yeah, We've got about 10 minutes left. I see another question come, comes through. How can mo emotional mental abuse be proven when filing for divorce as opposed to physical financial abuse, which is visibly evident? Okay, if I can uh, jump in the emotional abuse is generally a pattern. It's not a single event. Even in relationships that work, there's some form of emotional abuse every now and then. Um, when you try and enforce your will on the other person because you don't want him to do something. Um, you know, and the degree the varying thereof can be some form of abuse. Um, the other person, if you want to go out with a ladies night with your friends and your husband thinks that's a superbly bad idea, which it generally is, or he wants to go out drinking with his mates and he always comes back with him three to four hours too late and horribly drunk and it's a bad idea and you don't want him to go. Um, and there can be some form of abuse there when you try and stop the other person, when you try and exert your will on them. However, mental and emotional abuse, it's generally a pattern of abuse and you can pick it up over time. Um, and it's, you can prove it. Of course, it's much easier to prove a medical report that has a cracked jaw or a cracked eye socket that, or a photograph where you are looking worse for wear or like a puzzle with a couple of pieces missing. That's, of course, it's easier to prove. 
However, you can prove mental and emotional abuse. You generally will draft an affidavit and you will show the pattern of abuse. And you can pick it up. You can pick it up. Sometimes a person has recorded some of it. Sometimes there's accompanying text messages that go with it. Um, and uh, But generally, you can set out your story. Remember, the, the legal profession, it's the world's oldest profession. And the world's oldest profession is not prostitution. And it's not bodyguarding. It is, as a matter of fact, storytelling. So as your lawyer, I'm supposed to go to court and tell your story. I'm allowed to use the facts, previous court cases, and the law. And I tell your story. And if I tell your story properly, we can show the pattern of abuse. And we can show that generally on a Friday night, the person comes home drunk, or this and that and this and that happens. There's generally events that lead up to the abuse. And they're pretty much the same events every time. And the abuse will happen. You could sort of see it building up and then it will happen. And then it'll build up or build up again and then it'll happen again. Or it can just be every night when the person comes home and walks through the front door. Uh, you know, but you can, if, if you have a competent lawyer, they can tell your story and they can tell your story in such a way to the court that the court sees, yeah, but this is actually quite plausible. And of course, the court will then listen to the other side and what they, see what they have to say. We've got about eight minutes left, so I just want to check if anybody else has got any other questions on what we've been chatting about so far or anything outside of what we've chatted about that you would like either Shanda or myself to, to answer. Please feel free to either unmute yourself and ask the question or pop it in the chat box. While we're waiting for questions to come through, Shanda, something that always comes up with some of the, the sort of forums and, and the couples that I work with is, is customary or traditional wedding or marriage, is it seen as a legal binding um, commitment or relationship? It's very much seen as a legal binding marriage. Um, however, we've got two acts and they don't quite talk to each other. There's a customary marriages act. And if you had a valid customary marriage, you have to, then the divorce act comes into it. You have to get divorced by the divorce act. However, in terms of the divorce act, you have to prove that you were married and for that you need a marriage certificate. However, in terms of Section 9 of the Customary Marriages Act, for your marriage to be valid, it doesn't need to be marriage to be valid, it doesn't need to be registered. Now this leaves people with a big conundrum. Because now, in order for them to get legally divorced and have the remedies available to a divorcing couple, uh, you know, interim maintenance and financial remedies and whatnot, um, they now have to prove that they were married. Now, to do that, they then have to go get their marriage reg reg registered. And you require generally both parties there. Now, home affairs says, but where's your husband? And then you say to the husband, well, we must go get our marriage registered that we are getting, because we're getting divorced. And he says, oh, no, we were just dating. Um, because also, if a custody marriage is a legal custody marriage and there is no antinatural contract, it's in community of property. <clears throat> now, the husband's found himself a new girlfriend. Um, he'd much rather spend his money on her than give you half of his estate. So the old, they then, as a rule, says, oh, no, we were never married. We were just dating. Now, then you have to bring an application to force home affairs to register the marriage. Marriage, you will then do an application. You will then put there that show the wedding photos, the people were there, the custom, the custom. And why the Custom Marriages Act is, 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 once again, quite poorly drafted. It says the customary, uh, it, uh, the, uh, the, the marriage must have been observed via customary practices. Now, customary practices in different cultures are quite different. In the one culture, I have to finish paying the bola. In the other one, I never finish paying the bola so the families could always owe each other something. In the other custom, I must then be given a black dress that signifies I'm a married woman. And this and that, and this and that, and this and that. Now you've got someone from a Zulu culture marrying Kosa culture, someone in Kosa. Now, which one applies? Well, there's no clarity on that um, because the one person can say, but yes, you haven't finished paying the bola. And the other person can say, yes, but in our culture, we never finish paying the bola. Then they say, yes, but you were married according to Zulu culture. You know, do you understand? So it's a, and there's been recent judgments which absolutely haven't helped. Uh, us as legal practitioners and uh, indeed some of the lower courts, the magistrates, the regional courts, they are really looking for guidance from the higher courts on what exactly do you need to do to have a valid custody marriages. And there's been contradicting judgments. So there's arguments both ways. Um, firstly, if you are married in terms of customary law, then you have to get divorced in terms of divorce act. But unfortunately, the two acts are not speaking to each other and recent judgments certainly haven't helped. They haven't made it any easier. Generally, before a person can now get divorced, we have to apply to home affairs to have the marriage registered by one person going there alone without the other party. 
That sounds like quite a minefield, actually. <laughs> it's, it's, it's clear as mud. <laughs> okay, we've got about four minutes left. I just want to see any, any, any last sort of comments, tweets or thoughts, takeaways from our chat um, or questions that you may have from, from anybody that, that's listening and um, please feel free to unmute yourself or post in the chat box. Or is there any other particular topics that you'd like us to chat about with you? So if there's something that we haven't covered yet today that you would specifically like, <laughs> then um, please post it as well. Aha, I see there's a question about can, basically if I can just rephrase the question, can a person apply for a passport alone? Yes, you can. It's called a Section 18.3 application. I do them all the time. Um, when the other party is refusing for the, the, the children to go for a passport, we will then serve the application on them. We'll say it's in the child's best interest to that it, they go visit their maternal grandparents in India or their paternal grandparents in India. And the other party must then come and say to court why they don't believe it's a good reason for the children to have a passport. <clears throat> I've had stupid reasons ranging from I don't like the girlfriend, the other party's new partner, or real reasons, what guarantee do you have they'll bring the children back? Uh, they've said they're going to go and take them and stay there. Well, then we have to prove, listen, the person's got a bond here, they've got a life here, their own property here, and if they go and they don't bring the children back, they're going to forfeit all of that, their job, their life, their bank accounts, you know, they really have a life, they have a reason to return. And then the court must make a judgment that makes someone else, someone unhappy. Um, those are, and I've had real reasons where the person now wants to take their young children to northern Mozambique during malaria season. If a child gets cerebral malaria, it's a death sentence. There's nothing they can do. And I have been in hospital where people have come in with a child with cerebral malaria, and the doctor says to, said to the mother, I told you, do not take the mother. This child is going to die, and the child dies within the next hour. So that's a real reason, not wanting your children to go to a war zone or a place where there's cerebral malaria in, during malaria season. Um, those are real reasons. Not liking the new partner that your that your 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 spouse wants to take your ex spouse wants to take with on vacation, not a real reason. But it's a section eighteen three application, and I do them all the time. I see you have another one there. Can one travel with kids without the other parent's consent? Usually, when the other parent yes. is being difficult. Yes, it's it's the eighteen same eighteen three application. If you look at Section 18.3 of the Children's Act, one of the things you can do is apply for a passport. You need a passport to leave with the children. Once you have a passport and plane ticket, if the other parent doesn't even want to give consent, they've still got to give a consent affidavit. It's still Section 18.3 that we use to apply to force the other parent's consent or have them come to court and explain why they do not want to give their consent. And they better have a good reason, otherwise they're going to get slapped with a serious cost order. This is a high court application. And if you're being taken there against your will and you have to go there because you want to take the kids to Euro Disney and this person, the plane tickets have been bought and they were saying yes, 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 and now suddenly they're saying no, just to be obstructive, uh, we're going to take them to court and they're going to get slapped with a massive cost order. So, yeah, I think, Shanna, what's most important for what's coming out of all of these sessions that we've been having is that um, just like we do financial planning when it comes to our lives and we're constantly evaluating our, our wills and stuff like that, uh, we need to go into our relationships planning for the worst case scenario and to be prepared and, and know how to deal with these situations because you never know when life is going to change. I mean, just like COVID has changed our world and turned our world upside down in the last five months. You never know what's going to happen from a relationship point of view. And so it's important to know what your rights are. It's important to know what you're in for in terms of processes and, and also I guess where to go to for help. True. And it's, um, it's people like Paula and I that can actually help you if you don't come right. It's a level of communication that, that determines the level of your relationship. And it's difficult. I mean, people are complex and, and people's egos are fragile. And um, it's, 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 Making a relationship work is, it's not for sissies, you know. When I got married, my father said to me, um, now you'll know why I look so old. Uh, and it's, it's, it's really, it's difficult, you know, having, taking, being vulnerable in front of a person, um, having, uh, having another person have a veto right over your life um, on what you can and cannot do, it's difficult. And, and, and giving that person that kind of power and having them not abuse it is, is also difficult. And yeah, so, so relationships are complex. Um, it takes hard work. Um, 
there's beauty and love and understanding and companionships and relationships, but it comes at a price. And the price is compromise. You have to give up some of your personal freedoms and personal wants and needs. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it takes you places you don't always want to go. And that's why I have a job. And, and I, I think Paula has a job too. And if I can just in closing say to everybody, firstly, thank you very, very, very much. Um, if there's any other topics, uh, thank you to Kelo. If there's any other topics that you want us to cover, let us know, email us. Um, we do one of these almost every two weeks. And then if there's central topics coming out, once about every three or four months, once a quarter, we have a serious seminar where we sit physically with people in a room. Um, and there we deal with the central issues that come out and we also hand out material that deals with relationships, that deals with the law, sort of reference material. Um, yeah, so we use these, these um, webinars as an indication about what our next serious seminar, our half day or our day long seminar, um, depending on the uptake, should be about. So please email us, please tell us where we can be better. Please, uh, thank you Zandile as well. Um, uh, please tell us where we can be better. Please tell us what you would like to hear, what we didn't talk about, what you'd like to talk about more in depth. And we use this as a barometer for our serious big seminar. So please email us. Uh, we are nothing without you as our clients. We need your feedback and thank you so, so much. We so appreciate you giving up your time to sit and listen to us.